When people think of some of the hardest hitting TV cartoons in the modern age, it's not often that Clarence would be lumped into the pack. In content and in scope, the show usually doesn't stack up to everyone's standards of era defining television. Despite its shortfalls gaining wider recognition back in the day, it becomes more well liked with each passing year. It's probably had the most dramatic turnaround in perception of all Cartoon Network projects to date, and it's one you can't often chart through tweets or trending topics. There simply came a day where Clarence is well respected and fondly remembered like its colleagues. Maybe not as much, but just enough. Many would often try to attach some metaphysical reasoning behind the shift, when more likely more folks just came to accept the show for what it always has been. A low-key series about a kid navigating his own small world, and the bigger meaning behind that. The stories the show tells are great, but knowing the story around it will definitely give you a deeper appreciation for what you're watching. It's something I chose to address from the jump, because if you were there, you already know what it took to get to this point. Born out of a hole in the ground somewhere on CalArts soil, Skylar Page and Nelson Bowles were the first to nurture this idea. The former, coming off the heels of a stint on Adventure Time, pitched the pilot and got the green light sometime in 2012. The latter became art director for the series proper, and a whole slew of newer faces followed suit. After a considerable marketing push, the series finally dropped on April 14th, 2014. Within three months of its premiere, Skylar was out as showrunner. Obviously, this was pretty heavy news from the jump, and the way the story was broken caused a lot of confusion. It was rough seeing all of it play out, let alone being directly affected by his termination. There was a real, tangible fear that the show could be snuffed out at a moment's notice, and the crew weren't shy about conveying that. It was a scary experience for many involved, and one that likely did affect the show's standing in some capacity. It didn't get killed off immediately, but the advent of the firing hung over everyone like a lead balloon. I'm sure being reminded of this may make some of you tepid to revisit it here, which is totally understandable. Depending on how you feel, it may benefit you to know that no show is an island. Even if the guy at the top is a real visionary, it takes everyone's hard work to push it past the finish line. I wanted to focus on the other big guys that held it down until the very last day, so I decided to try and capture the big picture of the show straight from the horse's mouth. In one corner, we've got the main showrunner of the series after Paige's exit, Stephen P. Neary. In another, we've got one of two composers and sole songwriter on deck, Simon Panrucker. And in another, we've got the face of the business, head writer, and the eventual voice of Clarence himself, Spencer Rothbell, who we did not get a hold of specifically for this video, but he's left behind like 12 hours of interviews, guys. I, I, th I think we'll be fine. Hey buddy, it's me, your new old pal Clarence. I was wondering if you'd like to come and hang out with me and my friends, Sumo and Jeff. We have lots of fun. Also, we'll have a flying mystery pinata <laughs> that'll take us to space. And we'll watch a meteor shower. Sometimes the greatest of epics start in the most mundane places. For all the ground this cast of characters is covered, the spot where we come to be introduced to them is as droll as it is integral. Well, class, I'm sure you've noticed we have a new student with us today. Clarence, would you like to get up and say something about yourself? Actually, could I do something else a little bit? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Clarence. The seven-minute pilot starts off by establishing itself as plainly as possible. Being the fish out of water, the title character is left to familiarize himself with the outside world. The lack of music within the first three minutes helps set the tone. It isolates him as much as it underscores him. Despite his open and personable invitation to a sleepover, it doesn't seem like anyone was set to come round. At least, not until much later. Come on in, Jeff! What, you never seen a secret entrance before? The main trio assembled is one you can tell you'll get a lot of mileage out of. Each one subscribes to a particular theme of shape language, and it informs judgment pretty well. Round and friendly Clarence welcomes the rigid, seemingly stable Jeff, and entertains the slightly angular and chaotic Sumo in one fell swoop. Nothing super exciting in the immediate moment, but it's not long before they start to bounce off each other, and we get to see how one will round out the others. The sleepover itself starts to meander until Clarence remembers his trump card for the evening. Mystery Pinata time! 
He cues up the pinata with glee, and there's a palpable contentment until Sumo makes a startling realization. Wait a minute. What's that sound? Could it be? If you really think about it, the brief pocket of quiet before said realization gets a bit more tenuous each time you rewatch it. Clarence's pure elation mixed with the brief shock and horror allows this scene to hit its crescendo on a high note. On top of that, they manage to reincorporate that crank call in the best way. Despite the chaotic hijinks, the trio acknowledges to be a pretty decent experience, kicking off what would become a pretty poignant friendship. The extended version of this joint was repurposed into Season 1's pilot expansion, which was framed around this jetsons look and idealized future we thought we'd have by 2023. Other than the grizzled geriatric cyborgs bellowing cheesy 50s catchphrases, the only element that would indicate an extension is the brief cut at the two-thirds mark. It's at this point where this little ditty makes its debut. Hit the pinata, hit the pinata, sa sa wingata, hit the pinata, yeah, yeah, you gotta hit the pinata, hit the thing harder, hit the pinata. Outside of the obvious, the insertion of the sequence is near seamless with the rest of the day, it injects a bit of zaniness into the story, but the low-key beat doesn't shift the mood too dramatically. It feels like such an organic fit. The pilot goes out of its way to set itself up in a naturalistic space, which manages to carry over seamlessly into the show itself. Without breaking the barrier into full fantastical folly, the show displays an affinity for highlighting the mundane and ordinary. Many elements strike a balance between capturing a child's glamorized worldview and mirroring their unvarnished surroundings. To many, Clarence's appeal stems from how it expertly encapsulates being a kid in a way no other show of its ilk can crack. Throughout its inaugural season, you can see this reflected in a variety of production elements, the most visible of which being, of course, its visual aspects. Just from a glance, its title character sets himself apart from other Cartoon Network protagonists of the time, in a dominant era of increasingly thin-lined, leggy-looking leads, Clarence was set opposite as a rounder form with more dynamic posing. All these designs are stylized to some degree, but there's a deceptive amount of complexity found in the latter. From his earliest incarnation, there seemed to be a very specific construction presented, despite the looser approach to composition and character acting. What's cool about the designs in the show is like they're all it's very they're very diverse in terms of like shapes and, and design shapes and like um, um, I know like early on they were I think Colin Howard designed a lot of the characters in the show and there was a lot of like artists that were brought in to just explore their own interpretations of how they might be drawn and um, yeah I think the designs in the show are really fun and cartoony and weird and. Yeah. I think some people, they, they want like all one or the other, like it's got to be like hyper realistic King of the Hill or like super cartoony, you know, Ren Stimpy. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's fun right. to do a little bit. Yeah. There was a calculated effort put towards bringing seemingly discordant characters into a fully blended environment. Gleefully geometric characters with asymmetric flourish, litter a space where even the smallest background character has potential to gain a breakout role. The attention to shape language is distributed well amongst the ensemble, but it also helps reinforce the idea that this series prioritizes a kid's perspective. More commonly, this was seen carried out through Clarence's classmates, but we also see characters from other backgrounds highlighted in various stories. The majority of character work presents a diverse pastiche of voices and experiences with very, very few misses. In such a chaotic environment, the physical portrayal of its world is as important to the course of the story as the makeup of the cast. An aspect not often explored in depth would happen to be the color and background design. From the jump, the show was making use of vivid, lifelike palettes and landscapes. Having it set somewhere in Arizona is a bit of a radical departure for a show of its ilk. Typically, a generic suburb or metro area is all you need to set up a slice-of-life comedy. Here, while well, the production could have stuck to a set palette in theory, they assume a bunch of oranges and reds, they force themselves to think outside of the box. The pilot seems to identify its precise location as Prescott, a city about two hours away from Phoenix. With Aberdale likely being some fictional extrapolation, it seems to hit on the common notes quite well. The area we see in Clarence is a messier old school suburb that's sandwiched in between mountain ranges and desert. The disparity gives more variety than expected, that when you see the kids end up in a lush creek, 
you don't really question it. It fits so well that other characters can fit here too. One wouldn't expect the Arizona woods to have much in common with what's thought to be the New England sticks, but it did. Enough so that reused shots of Aberdell could easily be repurposed in the acclaimed Cartoon Network miniseries Over the Garden Wall. With overseas animation handled by Seiram, its movement design is pretty standard for a hand-drawn series of its time. Differences in tempo lean more on an artist's individual input rather than any specific house style. Upon further reflection, it doesn't seem like there are any noticeable nuances that could identify one director from another. Similarly, the variance in character acting and experimentation makes it tough to isolate styles by board artist. A lot of the time, the flow of the movement is measured, but it still captures the feeling of the moment. Personally, I noticed that individual shots held more weight depending on certain frames and how their sequences were timed. Being given a realistic setting is no indicator of Clarence being visually drab. Its straightforward animation style definitely satisfied its needs, but the occasional guest animated segment was still a great treat that didn't clash with the rest of the slate. The episode Tuckered Boys became the most prominent example early on, through the small boo amalgam's funky interpretations of the boys' sleep-deprived hallucination. You can see the trade-off in studio style between shots, but the atmosphere is so well established that it doesn't take you out of the moment. It's one of the few hard fusions with fantasy elements present, and for the first major experiment of its stead, it's one that's fondly remembered. What influences in real life or in media help create the voices for the characters in the show? Sumo, like I mentioned, was uh, Froggy from The Little Rascals was the reference point. To have like the kind of raspy voice. Clarence, I think, I don't know if there was any like specific person that was based on. Jeff was just Sean's voice, yeah. <laughs> Sean Gambroni. And we just like, we love Sean. I mean, so much of him is in that character. I mean, he's a lot, he's like a very sweet, nice person though. I think the, the crappy parts of Jeff's personality are not Sean. <laughs> Understanding Clarence's visual language is vital to following what it does with its characters. Finding the balance between what to display overtly and where to maintain subtlety is a task that exists all throughout. How each character feels is as important as how they talk. While there's a bit of an unorthodox voice direction going on, the casual vibe created is very purposeful. Circling back to the main trio, each kid has a different delivery. Clarence lisps and stumbles through a lot of his speech. A lot of what he said just kind of tumbles out of him. When he's on his A-game, Jeff speaks simply and precisely. He's eloquent, but doesn't make a point to flex on us all the time. Sumo says everything true off his chest, and most of his dialogue comes from an instinctual place. He's streetwise, and doesn't need to think through everything he's presented with. Their vocal footprint matches up well to personalities as indicated through their respective geometric traits. Archetypally speaking, each of them sticks to their expected role within their trio, but they start to be rewritten just as soon as they're established. Jeff was meant to be an accountable voice of reason, likely living up to his own carefully curated self-image. One that maintains that he be out of the way for many of the boy shenanigans, but rein everyone in when shit gets rough. There's no real tangible force or entity accounting for his rote precise ways, but he quietly believes himself to be entitled as a consequence for his conformity. They take the piss out of his ego as soon as the 18th episode, Average Jeff. That can't be right. You probably got my test mixed up with someone else's. This is a mix-up, right? Sumo's supposed to be the lawless wrecking ball rolling around, leaving a ceaseless path of destruction in his wake. Growing up in the home he was raised in necessitates that he be of the moment, which can often swing everyone in or out of trouble quite easily. It's rare when he encounters something he sees as bigger than himself, but it's implied that he's internalized negative feelings around his unfocused play style. The 15th episode, Dreamboat, serves to be the first major challenge to this limit. A boat, huh? Yeah. What you building it out of? Oh, uh, stuff that floats. I'll believe it when I see it. Jerry's boat has a fridge, too. In some way, this does make Clarence a bit of an anomaly. His two friends often find themselves with opposing motivations, and while his own path would feasibly fit somewhere in the middle, the kid's not meant to be overtly grounded. His presence is considered the glue that keeps the three of them together without dictating their course of action. 
The episode Slumber Party deconstructs this dynamic when the kid pulls himself from the weekend hang to join a girl's sleepover he was accidentally invited to. Jeff and Sumo carry on as if nothing's changed, but they've clearly lost the plot since their buddy's not around to manifest one out of nothing. They're left to cope with the numbing self-awareness that they probably don't have much binding them without him, but they end up jamming to some discount Europop in the end, so it's all Gucci. It's always stood out to me. They handled the parallel stories pretty well within an 11 minute framework. It's kind of written like an early Family Guy story if you squint hard enough. Make no mistake, each of the boys have their own moments individually, but that group dynamic is what sets the stage for Clarence as a concept to properly progress. Their differences are well established and make it possible for them to bounce off each other as well as they do. Even with all the events that shape them and morph their ideals and wants, their baser voice is set to grow stronger over time, something that sets them apart from a good chunk of the cast. What do you think was the most soulful or like impactful moment on the show? I think even just in that in that pilot episode, just that idea of, you know, I used to have a dad, but now I have a Chad. All these things that adults kind of describe as pretty, pretty earth shattering for children sometimes, or just have a hard time for explaining. And it's just like, no, kids, kids know what up, what's up. Kids are smart. Kids are just kind of, you know, living in this adult's world, but, but they will find a way to, to go along with it and make sense of it in their own way. Clarence's family unit boils down to Mary and Chad, a single mom paired up with a kind of dopey, but ultimately good hearted living boyfriend. Mary is always juggling eight different things, but she keeps everything together and makes it look easy most of the time. Chad didn't receive an elaborate introduction in the beginning, but his role is strictly tertiary, at least right now. We're conditioned to see Clarence as a wild card, but it's quite rare when his antics throw either of them for a loop. The show doesn't bother to detail all the steps taken to balance their lives. They're all just happy. The three of them don't have a strained relationship in the slightest. They're challenged to become better as a consequence of existing, but there's no clear rifts presented in the name of manufactured drama. Sure, there are some familial conflicts they sort out, but it's mainly external. Oh, I was hoping to see Damien. He was such a, he was such a gentleman and he had Well, a- Ma, we were just about to sit down to dinner. Uh, would you like to join us? Oh, yes, that'd be lovely. I would just absolutely- You don't stop talking, ah! you talk forever, you don't stop yapping your mouth, you- Ugh. It's been commonly noted that each character of the trio comes from a different socioeconomic background. Jeff lives with his two moms in a sizable cottage-type home. Sumo lives in a junkyard with his parents, ten siblings, and some critters. The Wendell gang live in a ranch-style home with a chicken coop in the backyard. Again, the disparity in the series' setting sets the stage for some notable storytelling. Smaller details within each household easily recontextualize any of these characters. Jeff values conventionality, but seems to leap at the chance to be a cut above the rest. Sumo is implied to be the situational run to the litter and works to set himself apart from his fellow loud siblings. Clarence is trusted to take care of the coop by himself. I mean, I would have never expected that. I mean, he's just there free basing the eggs like it's no big deal. Like, goddamn. The class consciousness is almost acting as a secondary character. It stays in the background, but it does help subtly inform the down-to-earth vibe achieved here. On a smaller scale, similar details are broached with the kids of Aberdale Elementary. Most of them don't receive individual focus until Season 2, but episodes like Clarence's Millions and Detention demonstrate this well without breaking immersion. I know school settings feel like a crutch at times, but a true diversity of stories couldn't exist without one here. Having well thought out characters can help guide you to a great story, but the specificity with which they're actually written is the X factor here. Are there any recurring themes of of Clarence that really resonated with you? I think just how mysterious the world is when you're a kid and just how um, even, even just being a few feet shorter, you just have such a different perspective on the world and such a different idea of, of what's important. You know, just emotions are really overwhelming um, and there's so much less structure. And just, just that feeling of being a kid is something that I really miss from, from working on Clarence. 
Being as closely tied into realism as it is, Clarence's plot lines are inspired mainly by a mix of real-world events, homages to other pieces of media, and occasionally some goofy old bullshit we're content to laugh at straight off the dome. Elaborate setups and evocative sequences took over the most grounded of tasks. As far as I can tell, Clarence is actually script-driven, a rarity on the network out of the originals. There was certainly more of an equal balance between the writer's and artist's visions, but the outlines make it clear that there was a precision in how certain scenes were laid out. I've always believed Clarence is best at selling you based on pure vibes. Atmospherically, it's hyper-competent at getting a lot across with limited time and dialogue. The most fond memories people have watching the show are centered around seeing any random character goof off or become lost in the moment. Those smaller experiences often aren't strictly needed to tell a story, but they do much beyond the realm of merely scene setting. In isolation, these are great sequences, but they also contrast well against the types of sequences that define episodes. They make it look easy, but the writers had a massive weight to carry in regard to character development. As entertaining as it is to listen to all the war stories of lost episodes and the 90s references that inspired them, some of the most important parts of the show can be the least flashy. Even without realizing it, there were so many little moments that give these characters an extraordinary presence. Ghost, I don't know what's... Uh, uh, what? Ghost dog? Out of all the Clarence writers, I don't think anyone is more underappreciated in that regard than Katie Crown. On paper, I don't think the totality of her work is summed up as well. She's not only the voice of Mary and Miss Baker, but also carries story or writing credit on a handful of the earliest episodes. There's less than a dozen or so that exist in this capacity, but many of them are integral establishing stories for the main cast of characters. Take Chimney, for example, a breezy 11-minute segment about the boys finding a Lassie-type XB in the woods. It is a clear-cut case of things happen the episode, but by watching the story play out, you get to gather nuance from these guys. Episodes like Turtle Hats and Dust Bunnies also emphasize how well she writes open-ended material, but they're a bit focused and satisfying to follow to their conclusions. It's easy enough to see that this show was simply kids doing stuff, but every writer that's laid claim to an episode has injected a lot of life into such basic premises. I think at the time I was more storyboarding and I was just, I had just moved to LA and I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. I work at a cartoon network. To, to me, all that backlash on the internet, like, I don't think I had really realized yet that that's, that was like something that people paid attention to. An attribute in aid to Clarence that's divorced from standard production elements would be its critical reception. Much of the online discussion of it early on was significantly negative, but within the wider context of its existence, it'd be more appropriate to say it was party to a hung jury. But I was going to take it out so we could play with this violence! Accredited media critics seemed to like it just fine, but regular folks who would normally be watching were much, much harsher to it. To some extent, it was a victim of circumstance, a concept that's conveniently diametrically opposed to the figureheads of the TV cartoon renaissance. A goofy slice of life cartoon airing alongside goofy action adventure serials that started off as slice of life was on par with international war crimes back then. There was a keen possessiveness or jealousy present within fans who newly discovered the latter genre. In their purview, cartoons just got good again. These cornball looking 90s rejects cannot and will not ruin this hot shipping goss. Or something like that anyway. It's difficult to not editorialize the scope of it. Even back then, I think there were some people who could see through it and could tell what was going on. I think it's just so hard because, um, you know, in a, way, in a way we're all fans. If you're making a cartoon show, it's, it's probably you want people to see it and you want people to enjoy it. You just don't know the kind of reactions you're going to get. And with the internet, kind of everybody's an expert. Everything is just kind of reduced to these like sound bites and hot takes. And there just isn't really like a lot of time for people to sit with your show before they have an opinion about it. Usually a lot of people already have an opinion about something before they start watching it. People get pretty upset about cartoons and I understand, uh, but it would be cool if we could all just maybe calm down 
a little bit. While it is like there, a lot of people's like live streams to to make these shows, it doesn't mean it can just like consume their their lives necessarily. Like I said at the top, the public reception of the show has been one of the most dramatic 180s a cartoon of recent memory could muster. To some degree, the environment established in the pilot mirrored the culture surrounding Cartoon Network at the time. Those in the audience who dared entertain the thought of him would do so out of curiosity and novelty, rather than genuine empathy for his character. The various impressions and initial assessment of the concept itself are all across the spectrum, as are the varying justifications for criticizing it. Whether they lean towards the positive or negative, most opinions were directly determined by the timing of its release. Though there's room to characterize several of its criticisms as arbitrarily biased, there are a few concepts that were understandably a bit more polarizing than the rest. The rougher art style was a deterrent for some. There's significant bias there given where the Cal art style thing was at, but even compared to older series of the same generation, its design philosophy was considered off-putting. Clarence himself was given the side eye when initial previews dropped. Cartoon Network is no stranger to belligerent, good-hearted protagonists, but presentation is key, and Clarence is, while purposeful, made it tough for people to get behind this center of this universe. Reasoning seemed easy enough to pin down. Oh my gosh, look at Zemo! He's so high up there! I can't believe how he got up there! <laughs> that said, traits like these would pale in comparison to reactions to the usage of gross-out humor throughout the show. While not consciously conservative in execution, gross out in Clarence is just there, naturally. It's utilized as a consequence of what's already there, rather than to create its own narrative or vibe or whatever. The most memorable instances of it in the wild are mainly relegated to season one, though further examples of it being used came few and far between later on. Those early examples became emblematic of how the show at large handled it. And said early examples likely fueled a decent amount of disconnect from the general animation canon. But there is really only one episode that established it in a league of its own, and actually kind of deserved it. Straight Illin is the 34th episode of the 51 episode order, coming in roughly two-thirds of the way through season one. Up to this point, viewers would have gotten to experience episodes like Puddle Eyes, Turtle Hats, and Dreamboat. Stories that can easily challenge your perception of these characters, as well as bring light to their universe in an intriguing way. This episode is not too far off from a typical Clarence story in concept, but in execution, its delivery left the characters heavily warped in the eyes of viewers everywhere. The horror. The horror. It starts off with our title character goofing off during lunch. He's a man of many extraordinary feats, mainly accomplished through dares. His classmates, mainly Sumo, are willing to take advantage of his bold ferocity, and somewhere along the way, it reaches a peak when Clarence is in the backyard, trying to shovel 500 deviled eggs down his gullet after school. By the time he finishes, it's a marvel he didn't end up dead, but after seeing his condition the next day, you'd probably wish he was. Oblivious to his apparent affliction, he tries to get through the rest of the day like normal, if not for his typical cohort avoiding him like the literal plague. The episode itself devolves into a horror-style chase, a quest for Sumo and Jeff to make it through the end of the school day without coming into contact with this contagious zombie. Spoiler alert, they didn't. In fact, the extent of the infection is so widespread that they let everyone out of school early. The only one left behind was Belson, attempting to one-up his rival with an extended version of the dare he made to take Clarence out in the first place. Look! Look at me, guys! The first time I saw this one, I remember it being a pretty gross sight. I was actually kind of looking forward to a new Teen Titans Go episode after this one. Nowadays, I find myself laughing along more than I'd be cringing. Uh, it's easier to revel in the absurdity of the tale itself after so long, even within the pandemic era, though I don't think it's aged as gracefully in anyone else's perspective. 
to date, it's considered one of the worst episodes of the show overall, not only for its exaggerative gross out, but for its alleged mishandling of its characters. There's an argument to be made for a double standard afoot. It's considered an outlier across the board, but if we started clocking all the gross depictions of things in the series, it could take all year just to name them all. Kids encounter gross shit all the time. If there was an earnest attempt to gloss over it in a broad sense, it would have changed the tone of the show completely. The fact that this is truly the worst of it is telling. Easy enough to chalk it up to growing pains and the crew trying to find the show's beat. It's rare when actual shock value permeates this universe, but believe it or not, they spent a whole other episode doing just that. The tramp was empty for the first time all day. I climbed on and started jumping. One simple flip, that's all I wanted to do. But when you tried, you broke your arm. It was so bad you could see the bone. Happened to everybody in my family. The juxtaposition between these two episodes is fascinating in concept. I don't think an episode from that early has gotten discussed more than straight illin, but it's clear that Too Gross for Comfort is considered a more traditionally acceptable classic, even if it isn't explicitly stated. I, I remember being at, at my brother's wedding and um, meeting some little kid who is like a, a relative of a friend of a friend or something and being introduced as like, hey, this guy works on Clarence and, and this kid was like 10 and he was like, that show's dumb, but I watch it. And it's like, it's like, ah, oh, cool. I like, I got you. I got you, kid. <laughs> like, you know, a lot of things are dumb, but we watch them and it's, it's fun. Clarence season one took just about 18 months to finish airing and Cartoon Network around 15 to announce the upcoming second season. The premiere of the first episode, Fun Dungeon Face Off, topped the ratings for yearly premieres, but the series' first year was marred by a rocky few months by July. By many accounts, the visibility it received as a new series did come to its benefit, but back then they actually released new media on a half-decent schedule, so there wasn't much time to stop and take inventory. Things were a bit touch and go, but season one hit the ground running, which made season two a future favorite to a cautiously optimistic few. In search of the crack and Jeff will use all his expertise. Clarence, though, will mostly be snacking, sailing the seven seas. Cross the ocean, too many lands. Battle pirates, losers, and thieves. Play your cards and fire your cannons, sailing the seven seas. Come along in search of some booty. Just make sure you have the right keys. There's a mermaid. Oh, what a beauty! Sailing the seven seas. Upon first glance, Clarence season two does not look too different from season one. Having been announced just over a year after the page ousting, it underscored a long road to finding the show's voice and refining the vision of what it could be. Obviously, the premise has always been versatile to an extent, but understandably so, the effort that was put into keeping Season 1 on track is not often spoken of. It also seemed like the tonal rift between it and the rest of the weekly lineup had become more apparent. Even the likes of Uncle Grandpa and Gumball were switching up their presentation and formatting a bit. From what I remember, it performed fine in the ratings, but despite the premiere success, it wasn't strictly competitive with the others. Adventure Time and Regular Show, in the midst of what many would consider to be seasonal rot, still pulled in around 2 million viewers for a good chunk of episodes within their six seasons. Clarence's Season 2 average per episode sits at 1.04 million. Decent enough for 2016, absolutely ballin' for 2023, but several steps behind the real stars of the Cartoon Network. It was never a colossal hit, but the content of Season 2 seemed to brush itself up after the core team behind it was solidified. Season 1 like took a while to make just because of some of the production problems. You know, there were a lot of things going on behind the scenes that were, that were pretty crazy. By 
season two, I think we had already started on season two. Nelson Bowles was, I think he was the the creative director. He was on for the pilot originally, and then he left for a little bit. And then he came back um, after Skyler left. He didn't really want to stick around too much longer, but he was able to help me and Nikki Yang um, really kind of mentor us at the beginning of season two, kind of ease us into directing on the show and everything. And then by the time he left, I took over as showrunner. Nikki Yang was directing. Also, David Oakes stepped in as a creative director there. And then Spencer Rothbell was there the whole time also. It was a, it was a pretty turbulent time, but I think we all really loved the show we were making and we wanted it to continue, even if it meant you know, the original creator wasn't going to be around. So it was, it was a lot of um, mixed feelings, but at the end of the day, I'm just really glad that we had the opportunity to, to keep the show going. Something I discovered pretty late in the game was a pair of documents published by former supervising director Ramey Muskis. Seeing his name off the bat, the first series I thought of was Hey Arnold, another offbeat cartoon about a kid's authentic experiences. What initially struck me was the praise he added page in regard to his attention to character design. It wasn't super uncommon to see solid constructions and old concept work from Skyler. The sketches from the first document only really cement his immense understanding of his idea. It's wild seeing how well certain drawings matched up to the final frames, in form and in function. Aside from this frame getting the recognition it truly deserves, there's also these tiny handmade mementos. These are obviously from earlier in the production, but it's not too hard to find photos and tokens left over from the crew. It's also not unheard of to see the production side as a tight-knit and attentive environment, but the extra insight into this specific relationship was intriguing to me. Not like there was much room to examine things after said ousting, but this account does diverge from certain others delivered soon thereafter. The second document, labeled the Second Season Manifesto, is a series of handwritten notes, observations, and tips to handle these characters going forward. Written under the pretense of an additional episode order added to the show, Paige took the opportunity to lay out his desires for where the crew could take these characters. Hey Amen. Today my good little show got picked up for a whole nother 13 half hour segments, which brings us up to 52 11 minute episodes of Clarence. Wow. That's a lot of stinking episodes. I hope people like it because they're sure getting a lot of it. It doesn't take too long for his message to read as passionately opinionated. We should also really figure out, or I should figure out rather, what Clarence's backstory is. I'm not a huge fan of backstory or origin stories. It's the stuff of fan fiction to me. People like to imagine their own backstories for characters. Why ruin that by only giving them one option? There should be glimpses just to get them thinking about what it is, but it should never be all revealed. There's rarely a situation where you know everything about a person's history. To me, it's more important how you handle your current and future situations that really matters. Clarence isn't special. That's what makes him awesome. He should do less awesome stuff. I want him to long for some things in this coming season. He doesn't have a bike. He really wants a bike. He wants to hang out with some of the older kids, the BMX kids. They're so cool. Obviously, when he eventually gets to hang out with them, he realizes they're a bunch of burnouts and not for the likes of him. Eh, or maybe not. That's a pretty tired storyline. Of course, not everything was followed to the letter. Clarence only ended up getting his bike towards the end of the season, and the story around it is unaffixed from that BMX kid's angle. After some basic comedy rules comes very clear guidelines and personality bases for these characters. Clarence is a social scientist. He likes to force social interaction even if it is incredibly inappropriate. He likes to hide people's things and write a list of clues that will lead to where they can find it. Jeff usually believes what he's told, plus tries his hardest to be normal. He subscribes to the idea that there could be a perfect normal person and he tries to cover up all the parts of his life that don't reflect that. Whereas Clarence tends to ask why and come up with alternative ways to be that are usually weird but somehow get the job done. Sumo has a more practical view of the world. He is a survivor. No manners but not rude on purpose. He knows what he wants and how to get it. He has a more realistic view, if sometimes oversimplistic or even mystic view on how the world works. It's definitely more straight to the point. 
The way certain words or phrases are highlighted gives this the air of being a reprimand or a correction. It'd be more realistic to see early characterizations as good enough for now rather than good for what we want to achieve. There was a clear expectation that these creatives would need to kick things up a notch to succeed at truly writing for Clarence. In this new batch, I want the quality of writing to be much higher and for the characters to be more true to themselves and relatable. Whoever's writing for Clarence should really put themselves in his shoes. Much of what Paige is saying seems like obvious storytelling tips, but seeing it laid out did challenge me to think of how this functions as an outline for the season itself. I don't think there was ever much discussion of ideas and concepts left over from Paige after he left, but even reading this in as neutral a context as possible, it seems like the latter chunk of the show ended up matching his general vision quite well. The greatest point you could try and litigate would be that one about fantasy sequences. All these scenes stem from a character's imagination, but it's unclear as to how far you could take one of those before they approach filler in his eyes. Do seek out feelings and experiences that are really portrayed in animation and figure out a way to do them that is entertaining and interesting. Don't reuse dialogue and phrases that have already been in episodes. Don't rely on characters' most obvious traits. Stop making Jeff so worried about getting dirty. He's got more interesting issues. Don't make Clarence too dumb or obsessed with food. He's an outgoing weirdo with no sense of social norms. Don't make Mary a nag. What's interesting about her is that she doesn't really give a shit what Clarence does as long as he doesn't get hurt and cleans up after himself. Do keep drawing Mary with a fat ass, you know what I'm saying? That shit is bodacious. Keep it jiggling, keep drawing that, I like that. Do have cinematic staging. Don't have cliche posing. Do have Clarence absentmindedly interact with everything around him. Always consider the environment the character is in and what an excitable child would want to touch, pick up, break, and climb on. Do you watch live action movies, watch live action comedy, watch weird people you see and know in real life. Don't rely on old tired animation tropes. Just as you start to wrap your brain into knots interpreting all these do's and don'ts, that last page hits you like a pallet of bricks. Young life is a prison. It's really fucking boring. I wish I know what to do with my time, but I can't think of anything. So I'll just watch TV. Aw, everything on TV is a magical fantasy world, and I can't do magic, so I guess I watch TV forever. Wrong, bam, Clarence is on, no excuse, he's an awkward chubby little no front teeth motherfucker, and he's making it work for him. He knows life ain't easy, he fails all the time, but he keeps on trying. A. Man. Wow. What stuck out to me was how it stood in contrast with the little existing testimony of his time there, especially since pre-existing comment serves to contradict it as well. However true any one account may be is up for individual interpretation, but if one takes each of them at face value, the entire scene does give us a multifaceted peek behind the curtain. This document details a portrait of someone who had a very particular idea to impose, one who may not have been willing to cede the full scope of creative control over to their peers, someone who was more hands-on than expected, but may have been a major jerk about it. Complex human beings that bear witness to this could recognize the ingenuity at play in a creative context, but are also able to reconcile problematic behavior when it crops up. Paige's process is not all-encompassing of what the series is or even what production may have been like. I wanted to thoroughly center this video around how the art was essentially of its own creation. That said, it did feel like an editorial disservice to not present this information as part of that. It does reaffirm the interconnected nature of this art form. And this concept has made it clear from the jump that literally everyone was involved in making Clarence into what it is and what it's known for today. The impact of each contribution can't be easily quantified in any concrete sense, but I do think it's important to give credit where credit is due. Sometime during preliminary research, I dug through the comments of that one Cartoon Brew article and rediscovered this. 
The news of his ousting broke just three hours shy of the 11th episode's premiere titled Zoo. By this point, the prospective audience was left to contend with this unassuming show, with barely 10 episodes to its name, being built in the wake of such shitty, destructive behavior by the man who is seemingly supposed to be in charge of it all. Everyone's experience is different, and it's not uncommon for different people on the same production to live opposing realities. These newer discoveries were compelling, they did activate some almonds, but processing them comes with the cognizance that they are not the entirety of Clarence. It's not the totality of these people or what they did. This obfuscation of clarity is somewhat congruent with the series' journey itself, if not the nature of collaborative art itself. These events had a direct effect on how the audience could view it, but in the full scope of what it is, it is only one part. It's easy to color it as all-encompassing, which doesn't take away from the gravity of the situation, but it really isn't. Actually, it reminds me of an episode from this season that had a similar effect on a much, much smaller scale. I mean, that, that was an episode that I directed, and I, I remember just wanting to give that episode a very sweet ending. Tiffany Ford and Michelle Shin did a really amazing job boarding it, but I think that was something that was kind of just something that I wanted to do. Just, just trying to give it a very sincere feel. The 20th episode of season two titled Mystery Girl marked an unofficial turning point for the show. The premise is all but foreign, a story about Clarence befriending an unlikely companion over the phone, but the atmosphere the episode creates came across as peculiar for some. Unorthodox, even. This was the greatest experiment of all time. For people that checked out mid-season one, the change in tone presented felt like an anomaly. This weird, gross show about this weird, gross kid is having a wholesome experience with a pen pal. Bizarre world shit, I tell ya. In the middle of executing some prank calls, the boys eventually get this girl named Bella on the line. She fritters away the rest of the day with Clarence, talking about a variety of subjects. Once they realize how much they enjoy talking to each other, they plan to connect again. Days and weeks pass, and Clarence is fully absorbed in this friendship, much to the chagrin of his two road dogs. The kid misses one call, and this whole world unravels. It's a bit of a disturbing turn for him to take. Not to say he hasn't been distressed or disappointed before, but just shy of his transformation in Lil' Buddy, it's his most dramatic shift yet. It's that quiet sadness that really gets me. The shot of the filled up answering machine is crazy. It just so happens the two manage to get a playdate set up in the middle of a park, the first time that they would have met face to face. It's an exciting, albeit nerve-wracking occasion, Takes a bit of warming up, but once they take the plunge, they're off to the races. It's a simple, straightforward story, but they end things on quite the high note. Mo, <laughs> oh, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> Typical Clarence. <laughs> In some way, this was more of a cinematic approach than what was expected. Clarence exhibits a certain level of sensitivity that's more palatable. It's no secret he's a people's person, but the way he interacts with this random girl and tries to make her feel more comfortable is a subtler and easier approach that non-fans can really latch onto. The average Belson adventure simply cannot compete. To outsiders looking in, it's solid evidence that this show has matured and evolved past its reactionary roots. To the rest of us, it's as close to business as usual as it gets. It would be a bit silly to ignore this episode as some sort of positive progression altogether, but a story like this is not as far removed or out of character as one may think. It's almost as if this series of a by then 70 episode count had depth and nuance to its structure. Weird, huh? There were room for all these different voices and directing styles, and um, I don't think that the fact that that episode is really sweet and slow and kind of almost almost boring in parts like slice of life i don't think that 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 takes away from your ability to enjoy like any of the crazier like zanier surreal episodes to me it's just clarence is like the platform for all of us to get all these different genres out um which is always fun now by this point in time the show had a much better sense of rhythm 
Clarence is character-driven at its core and thrives off those small moments that play a part in the larger tapestry of the cast. While it's common consensus that the general public mischaracterized the show, there were also times when it was kind of dragging it a little, not, not at all helping itself. When the ensemble became a well-oiled machine, certain characters stood out from the rest to the point of sustaining their own stories. Ten to one, I haven't had the chance to list off every single one. There's enough to fit them in a poker rap type spiel, but there's only a few other exploits that I chose to highlight. Both the season premiere and season finale are highlights I'd highly recommend taking a look at. The former gives you a mystery piece split between five characters you'd never guess would be grouped together, and the latter gives us a clean sense of finality through a character that has barely existed up to this point. Game Show gives Breen another chance to shine. Plain Excited is a great choice for the Chad enjoyers in the audience. Clarence Wendell and the Eye of Coogan is an adventuring tale with great pacing. It keeps you on the edge of your seat. Freedom Cactus is an obligatory mention for obvious reason. Hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. Oh. Many of the others I find myself going back to are often centered around the main trio. We'll get to those in a little bit. But I did notice one character that has carved out a small niche for himself up to this point. Belson has been the conduit for many a great story. He's the closest thing we've got to an antagonist, but even considering that, he's largely not a huge obstacle. He's feigning indifference most of the time, but when he's not, he's given us plenty of golden opportunities to explore him and get into that character growth. Like having to deal with Clarence at the zoo and having to deal with Clarence at the sleepover, and having to deal with Clarence in a full-body cast. The most memorable episode was most likely that time his mom ruined his KD ratio and COD so he could take out the trash, which is very based. I gotta hand it to her. But with all those being from Season 1, Season 2's ideas make any of those look like chump change. I really enjoyed this joint called Belson's Backpack. It's a loose expansion on the climax of the zoo episode, and it's one I didn't remember come time to rewatch the series. Belson's secret double life as a graphic novelist is discovered by Clarence, who becomes his biggest supporter and eventual story consultant. It's a bit of a dramatic tale, even if there are no formal stakes involved. Most of it is consumed with the former going through the creative process, the rise, the fall, the unofficial hiatus due to writer's block. Bro would never admit that having a cheerleader is creatively motivating, but the whole experience definitely did him some good. It's just rewarding seeing this grump open up and be the slightest bit more vulnerable. Of all the spoiled rich kid archetypes, Belson is among the most fun to see play out. The whole thing, it kind of reminds me of Wacky Deli, but if they decided just to tack some optimistic ending on it, you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Just give me a few more months, we'll, we'll cover it eventually. But hands down, one of my favorites of the entire thing. In addition to these, this show is well known for its scrapped episode concepts. I don't think most would complain about any of the 130 episodes we were given all together, but the ideas that went unused almost give you a reason to. There was, an, there was something that we wanted to do where uh, we had an idea for like an episode about a tornado coming to hit the town. And they were kind of worried that like maybe it would air and there would be a natural disaster that would happen simultaneously. There was an episode we did, we, a premise we pitched called Clarence the Fr Friendly Ghost. Mm -hmm. And we thought it would be <laughs> funny if like... He fell out of a treehouse and hit his head on a rock and died. And his ghost came out of his body. And it was like the whole episode would be him floating around as a ghost, like pulling pranks on his friends and family. And like the, well, the, the version that we definitely couldn't do was that like everyone was just very depressed that he was dead. And he's just floating around like, isn't this funny? I'm pulling pranks. And then they also didn't like this idea that we had where we thought it would be funny to treat it very seriously in the episode but then at the very end the tornado would kind of tasmanian devil out into uncle grandpa and then he'd be like, good morning <laughs> but you know like we couldn't we couldn't do that dark of a take on it but uh 
it, that was one that got approved actually you know they're like no like if you if you're gonna do anything with that character it has to be like a proper full crossover mm -hmm. that we can promote and say this is a crossover and we were like oh but come on it'll be funny we, we kind of threw it in because we wanted to do puddle eyes where he falls asleep in a mud puddle and the mud crusts over his eyes and he he's uh walking around not being able to see the whole episode and we're like oh we were scared that they would take it the wrong way and so we threw threw in clarence the friendly ghost with that bachelor premises thinking it was like a red herring episode that they would be like oh you definitely can't do that and then they would ignore the the other one that we really wanted to do uh but they approved both of them which God. was really nice and you chose and not we to like, do the ghost one yeah we just no. thought it was a little too stupid i want to see clarence <laughs> okay. die there's plenty of knee slappers thrown into the mix. The connection to Uncle Grandpa is all too serendipitous, frankly. Most of these are far out there and are not really grounded, but they're seemingly well in keeping with what the series was able to do in totality. The most prolific idea in terms of scale was fully produced and released in a half-hour package titled Capture the Flag. There's not much to say about it independently. It's perfectly fine. It's not exactly a fair fight, fully cognizant of this, but that other Cartoon Network show kind of wore it better. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say, this was done in a uniquely Clarence way, nobody else could do it. Though the eventual resolution might be easy to see from afar, might be a little predictable. Still, it took a lot of cross-coordination to make something like this work. It's a small world, but they've got more space on the field to play with here, and that, that's, that's good to see. The wider world of Clarence sees itself expanded in similar fashion. We've already bared witness to what's done with light continuity elements, but Season 2 is allowed to do more with this foundation. The episode Field Trippin' introduces West Aberdale Elementary, a location that becomes more relevant in the following season after an unexpected shakeup of sorts. Clarence doing Clarence things is nothing new, but helping this random little kid integrate into his new environment was a wholesome piece of foreshadowing I'd think about from time to time. Between the three boys, their story is extended from the same framework. Some elements are here to hit their apex in the following season, but everything fits within the same self-contained format. There's not too much of a long-running narrative attempted through their adventures, but since all three of them are moving through life at different speeds, their divergence becomes the basis for conflict. Same issues, slightly different context. Jeff's insecurities and paranoia has grown to include increasingly petty as well as entertaining issues. Jeff's secret found a way to demonstrate this scaled up while also humanizing the little blockhead. So I can't even tell anyone? No. Not even my mom? No. What about Sumo? No. What? Not even Sumo? No. Oh, what about Miss Baker? Nobody, Clarence! Sumo's increasing amount of belonging and sense of responsibility tests him as a grounding force in situations where he's taken out of the main trio's element. There's like half a dozen episodes that focus on him. I like Skater Sumo, personally. Uh, let's see. Oh. Oh, oh, oh! oh. Ah! That was so rad! No, it wasn't! To this end, you would perhaps expect some friction from Clarence's direction, or some indicator that he's being pushed somewhere else. It's easier to see him more as a setting or a framework to experience the world he inhabits, but they cultivated a different image for him here. If anything, they reinforce how dynamic he still is. In fact, they spent a whole episode deconstructing Clarence's perspective on his role in their adventures. I guess everyone figured out their problems without me. Hmm? Sorry, guys. Was I being a bad friend? What? Clarence, you're a great friend! It's a really nice subversion, since even fans of the show are susceptible to believing his own hype to a crazy degree. Good simple takeaway for the actual kids watching as well. Similarly, there's an episode that does tie into the spirit of this character quite well, while also being able to examine what makes him tick. Oh my goodness, there's brown balloons and brown chairs and brown tablecloths and everything's brown just like I wanted. I'm not sure how well Birthday is remembered, but it very much strikes me as a codifier. It's Clarence's special day, but it's not even really about him. It's about Jeff and Sumo and the value they hold in their relationship with him. 
See, they went over to his house with the expectation that they'd be rolling up to your average, everyday, intimate get-together, when really, it was something else. <laughs> they tried to keep it moving like it was just the three of them, but they get iced out by the dozens of other kids here. Internally, they compartmentalize this as a Clarence issue, meaning he's purposely taking us for granted and the disrespect is palpable here, so they fuck off after a little bit to maul in their treehouse. The birthday boy tracks him down at just the right moment, and he is beside himself, head in hands remorseful for overlooking their presence, even if accidental. He brings him back to the party, determined to keep his besties in orbit during the festivities, and uh, things pretty much end there. There's a lot of little details that just get me. For one, the story itself is laying out clear chronological progression. The backstory that carries it doesn't even feel like it fits entirely given the Clarence that we know. Apparently this man went from being the de facto odd man out in the pilot to having the whole class come celebrate his birthday. If we're assuming he got to Aberdell Elementary at the start of the school year, it means that these changes happened over the course of a few months. Remember, Jeff and Sumo met him when Bro became part of the class. So they've genuinely been ride or die for a relatively long time compared to everyone else. But with such a setup, it's made crystal clear how much things have changed. It kind of serves as a reflection of the audience. It forces you to reassess how you see this little kid. Based off of what we've seen in this episode, his friend's behavior suggests a lack of confidence in him. At the very least, they're looking to shield him from circumstances that don't really affect him uniformly. Like, if it doesn't fail parties was not already a deterrent for an attempted birthday bonanza, I'm not sure what would have been. Clarence has always been up for anything. If he has one person or one little critter to keep him company, he can still have the adventure of a lifetime. I don't get how their first thought was, we, we gotta protect him here. That's not to say either of them looked down on him or anything, but this does sort of suggest that they underestimate his abilities or something. His popularity, his ability to hold down the fort, what makes him tick and what makes him pull back. If that reading is closer to the truth, it does seem like a wild oversight to make. I don't think I fully grasped the thought process. I mean, they're still all kids and everything. Not everything they do has to make sense. But it seems like projection to me. It seems more likely that Jeff or Sumo would come to blend into the background next to their friend, or at the very least, they'd have, like, a smaller niche of people that they could hang out with. This thing bring me to eventually ponder the sense of singularity involved here. To some end, it's easy enough to see this as Clarence's world that we're all living in. It's his obligation to drive every story and move things along when not centered around said title character. Clarence's perspective is accepted as the main vantage point through which to experience this world, but it's far from the only one. Granted, it's way more likely you'll see through the vantage point of a supporting lead rather than incidental character 143, yet many of the meta-jokes or more fantastical elements give way to different perspectives being displayed. Like they're built as jokes, but the gags themselves do reveal whose eyes we're seeing through at any given moment. <laughs> Oh no! A bear! Oh no! A bear! It says I need to download a plugin. No, no! Click no! Yes. Just need to do a quick reboot after it downloads. Did it work? I don't feel any different. Jeff, what's wrong with this computer? Excuse me. This is my seat. You best keep on moving. Are you sure you don't want to come, Clarence? Nah, I think I just need a nice quiet night by myself. Just me and my toys. Probably gonna go to bed early. Okay, see you later. Sumo, where'd you come from? You hear something? I don't think so. Did you? Well, I guess I just really wanted to goof around with my buddy. Yeah. 
Oh, you guys. No matter what, you guys are always my bestie buds. <laughs> oh, man. Much of the magic of Clarence hinges on the imaginative renditions of realistic events. With its setting firmly grounded for the entire run, the series is well known for giving as much credence to extended daydreams as it would solid story setting scenes. It's appealing, but it's also quite deliberately crafted. There's a particular balance in keeping fantasy and reality elements from cannibalizing each other's presence. The series itself is told through a stylized lens often through the title characters, but its method of storytelling merely allows for the most neutral story to shine through. It's actually an attribute you can see carried out through more recent animated programming. We're often not just left with the inner machinations of the title character, but rather the vast aesthetic of the environment to harness. I've only gone through the bare basics, but it's easy enough to paint a picture of what might have won people over. Visually, there's not much of a significant shift present, from early on, the show made the most of its presentation in conjunction with the mood the scripts were pursuing. It does have a tangible identity in this regard, but it's difficult to say it truly settled into anything. They were always doing different things, you know? From this season, the first example I could point to is from this season's Tales of Mardrinia, where they got that one animator dude with the retriever avatar to imitate Disney Renaissance type fluidity. Also, it's a good Percy episode. Hey, Percy. Thanks for having me over. I brought some celery. <laughs> I like Percy. There's also this small widget made for the season finale. While I don't think there was much in the way of visual evolution, there are some tangential pieces of clearance media that serve to exemplify this continuous creativity. Over the course of the series' lifespan, a series of 14 shorts were released. Taking on a variety of styles and perspectives, the two-minute vignettes unpeel additional layers of this universe that's not often explored. A lot of the same seasoned board artists got to flex, a lot of the same dynamics, but under even more experimental conditions. Half of them are centered around Clarence, but the ones that aren't tend to go extremely hard in the paint. My personal favorite happens to be the one where they parody that one famous Canadian short. The attention to detail is absolutely frightening. <laughs> Rainy Day and Beach Blast best exemplifies Clarence in aesthetic, while Big Boy and Doodle Battle highlight the essence of its character interaction. People who would be worried about certain characters overwhelming the story probably would get a reprieve here. In some way, it was giving a preview, a little peek behind the curtain of how this show's narrative chops were developing in real time. You're getting the world mainly through a specified POV, but not one that takes away from the world itself. I've never heard anyone deride the fantastical bits of Clarence by itself, but you do get to pick and choose between two sides of the show. From 2015 to 2017, Boom Studios released a handful of Clarence comics, graphic novels, and one-off stories. They're not usually mentioned, but I did want to at least acknowledge them here because they fucking rock. Generally, very solid reads, and it seems like the right attention was given to this collection. The variant covers are particularly notable. Everything except for the original four comics were a blast to read, but even then, they demonstrated a decent understanding of the main players and what they were like. I could see them being passed on to someone who might have some interest in the cartoon, but is unable to take the plunge. Same goes for this weird compilation type issue about road trips. Its tone is more consistent with the show, but the stories are strictly shorts material. The graphic novels go so hard in the paint, I love that they break away into more fantasy elements. In some way, they actually felt more grounded than the other ones. The premises they ran with could thrive in short form or long form just fine because the focus is still largely on these characters. The art can be a little distracting at points, but less for being loose and more for having some truly cursed frames. It is a fun time, but any of these could scratch the itch for more Clarence if your life depended on it. We gotta fucking, we gotta fucking talk about the Area 51 <laughs> one for a minute. So like, these guys from the CIA they kidnap Belson in, in broad nightlight 
and the three boys run in, Leroy Jenkins style, to save them. Eventually, they get captured and questioned, uh, and everybody at this facility is hell-bent on making these little eight-year-olds talk, except for this one psychologist lady that's like, what the fuck, these are just a bunch of kids, guys, what are we doing here? It takes a while, but the four of them finally escape, and once they are outside of the building's walls, the psychologist lady <laughs> pulls up in a military-grade jeep to bust them out of there. And it leads to this whole dramatic-ass chase sequence, like, <laughs> look what they're doing. This is all extra. So after she drops them off at this drive-in that we, we started the story at, she has this, this revelation. She's like, damn, you know, I got into psychology to help kids. Not to help the U.S. government get away with their crimes. She realizes, you know, after a matter of days or weeks, the government's gonna catch up to her. There'll probably be some federal indictments coming down the pipe. It's looking pretty bleak, bros. Can't, can't get any worse for the immediate future. And she slowly pulls up into the drive-in, and she just kind of sits to reflect. And the line she leaves us with is, Man... I should have become a teacher like my sister. And then... And then... Like, you can't- you just can't do this in the cartoon. It's- it's impossible. Look what they did. Look how they were spitting, dude. Gold stars. Gold stars for everyone on this issue, honestly. This video would also not be complete without acknowledging the most elite fusion this side of CN City. I'm talking, of course, about Claire Vangelian. It's probably the only pop culture type homage that Rothbell had absolutely nothing to do with. Shocking, I know. He, he, just, he just hadn't watched Ava up to this point. So everyone else was men in the paddle stations coming up with the most cracked out art we could have seen. They started this in mid season one and they ended it by, by the time season two was done. They cobbled together some of the greatest art in the history history also there's this mug let, let, let's just bask in the mug for a second huh i'm not gonna pad out this section because i know deep down uh, there's nothing to be analyzed this is just perfection it's beautiful chef's kiss this is, this is extraordinary content it says absolutely everything that tumblr chose to censor this one they were, they were so real for that Clarence Season 2 took just over a year to finish airing, with the upcoming season premiering right after the end of the second. Admittedly, tracking down an announcement date for Season 3 was difficult. It does seem like each season was the product of a genuine renewal rather than some kind of cracked-out batch release. But for some reason, the final one was not put on the map. Or at least I'm not aware of it. I remember promotion being a bit more consistent, with the question of renewal being uncertain, but also a presumptive outcome. Nevertheless, the heights reached here make it an unforgettable experience that smoothly guides us into the next. Nelson, Percy, Sumo, <laughs> Jeff, Clarence. <laughs> You know, we, we talked a lot about different ideas of how to end it, and we just kind of felt like we wanted it to just feel like um, the world of the show could almost imply that it could live on beyond the series. Yeah. Like, ah, just, you know, if I was a kid watching this, it would feel like, oh, these characters that I've grown to love 
they are just kind of out there doing their thing still, you know. In terms of like why the show got canceled, I never got a real answer on that. I remember talking to an executive who kind of explained with kids stuff like, you know, kids grow up on these shows and then they kind of outgrow them. Mm -hmm. And then there's, unless it's like a mega hit, like they kind of want a new batch of shows for a new group of younger kids to grow up on. This season was confirmed to be the show's last after the first few episodes dropped. If you weren't keeping up with the show online, the final batch was likely bleeding into everything else. Burning through 40 episodes in about 16 months, the actual scheduling made it rather easy to lose track of. Half the season got burned off in a month, including a cluster of episodes that were produced to adhere to the bomb format popularized by Steven Universe. Characteristically, it's still Clarence, but you can tell things are a bit different than they were before. The tone each story takes on is a bit more muted and details maintain a stronger sense of continuity, but beyond that, it does kind of feel like the end. Well, look what you just did. You got Naz all upset. You, you done made Naz upset. Now, one aspect of Clarence I've neglected to address so far would be its use of music. Given the makeup of animation's cultural footprint the last decade or so, it's safe to say that it's a damn important piece of the pie. Within the realm of 6 to 11 aimed animated series, there's not an abundance of musically inclined programs, but the ones that are out there have enjoyed enduring popularity. People will 110% continue to dick ride the same seven tracks because, however long they may be, those tracks connected with them on a level independent of the cartoon. Creating music requires a different skill set to produce and a different part of the brain to enjoy. Hell, writing, composing, and scoring all require different things. It's a complexity that keeps common music analysis out of video essays and retrospectives like these. I mean, that, that might ultimately be for the better. If a pack of feral music nerds started earnestly dissecting the Phineas and Ferb discography, I promise you we'd all be in for a very bad time. Many cartoons can't even write 11 minute stories that are coherent, let alone dedicate time to developing a distinguished musical aesthetic. For better or for worse, the few that manage to stick around and the fewer that add a hyper-personalized style got by with a lot more. Even series that aren't that music heavy can pump out a banger or two that'll stick. Clarence's music stands apart from many of its contemporaries in that most of it is non-diegetic and that it's mostly centered around setting up an environment. In other words, most of the songs you hear aren't being belted out by our main cast, nor are many of them focused around them specifically. Instead, they're working with the visuals behind the scenes to drive the ambiance and help the storytelling in a subtler way. Think about what the intro communicates. It's bright and frenetic and constantly moving. It's setting you up for the meter of the show itself, an adventurous slice of life series about the folly of childhood. The outro is the opposite, it's a sleepy pop song set to a static image of a power line at night, reminiscent of many a day after a full slate of activities. Visual edits can also do some heavy lifting depending on the circumstances. In theory, board artists that swap out certain shots do help change any one track's impact, though generally they're already dealing with future bangers has is. So the actual, the theme song I went to a primary school, which they were at, uh, my nieces were at at the time. I did like a workshop with them to create an, an audio story and then just for fun. And then we, I got them like shouting, I don't care what you say! And trying to do their best <laughs> American accent. But uh, <laughs> I don't know, sometimes people are like, oh yeah, I thought it didn't sound quite like fully American. And then, so yeah, I went back to my niece's house um, a while later and did this extended version and got them doing the rest of the words, which was really fun. Between the animatic and the final product, there's a few shots that were taken out or added in for clarity. The timing of each shot is significant too. It feels uneven and choppy, but there is a rhythm there. The erratic haze of being a kid is being captured in a way that ties directly into the vibe of the track. Within each specific story, each composition is doing specific grunt work. In different ways, each song also feeds you different pieces of information based on what you get from its visuals. With over 200 songs composed for the show, each one blends with other elements 
to give it a sound that's closer to home than other shows it shares a time slot with. It's important to communicate this because by season three, the music takes on more importance, and understanding of this world and how it feeds into its sound is going to be its X factor here. Over the course of the show, there were quite a few different directors. Because I work in the UK, so I've only ever worked remotely with people. So I just kind of see someone once a week on my screen and have a chat about the episode, and then I just work on my own. So partly being able to adapt to different directors and their ways of working, and partly being able to adapt to different types of music. Because, uh, yeah, there was like a lot of parodies on the show or, or pastiches, different types of music. Season three is a bit of an enigma. In action and in attitude, it feels like a prominent tipping point. It's a somber Sunday afternoon with the school week looming over it. Many of its episodes could be seen primarily as character studies, complementing the exploration of the West Aberdale storyline and how it shifts the goalposts. They don't serve to lay down any more info about the cast, more so just wrap up loose ends and give everyone their proper bookends. In hindsight, realizing the time period the show was going out on makes for a sobering discovery. The true dearth of its impact while airing is hard to estimate, but to some extent they were already new concepts that tried to fill its shoes. Big City Greens eerily dropped its first episode about a week before Clarence wrapped, Craig of the Creek had already premiered about three months prior, with over a dozen episodes out there before the time came. Next to Clarence, the latter has always been placed in a weird position as the pseudo-successor to the former. The weirdness intensifies if you consider the fact that Clarence is partially inspired by Recess, which of course is compared to both shows and Nexus as well. Can I just can I just go off on a brief tangent for a sec? I've never understood pairing these up. Ever. Ever. Like, they have similar setups in isolation, perhaps similar points of appeal, but they're so far away in execution. Like, technically, Clarence influenced Craig. They share so many board artists between them. I'm willing to bet at least some of their tenure on the earlier show helped inform how they wanted to go about things. Whether it meant, oh, we should do things more like that, or... Yeah, we did this before, we should we should try and do something different. Craig is way more polished and cinematic. Not seemingly as raw as Clarence, but it's nostalgic in a different way. Everyone can pick their poison, both of them have their perks, neither is a one-to-one -one substitution for the other. When Clarence started, this channel was in a whole other phase of branding. The synergy in casting childlike comedies back-to-back -back with older kid adventure serials was still out of place in a lineup of shows spiritually more in its stable. In real time, it wasn't as gloomy as I'm making it out to be, but the mood is certainly a change of pace for the show. With this in mind, there's one series that can retroactively be seen as a return to form of sorts. I think The Fungies is like this reboot of like an 80s show that never existed, kind of, um, and it's very... It's very zany and there's a lot of, you know, cartoon mischief. Um, this character is really interested in science, but ultimately it's kind of about him learning how to, how to interact with other people better and how to um, sort of look, look at himself and look at the world and, and sort of grow up and, and learn these lessons. Um, and the fact that that's a terrible pitch is, is probably why more people haven't, <laughs> haven't seen it. But, you know, I should just say like, oh, it's like Smurfs. You know, it's like Smurfs, but a little more mindfulness and a little weirder. The Fungies is a 2020 Cartoon Network original that's largely responsible for this video existing. I started planning this beast out a few mere months before the HBO Max purge happened. The series was already a casualty by the time I got to talk about it in the scripting process, having not been aired much in the United States and only available for digital purchase post-purge, it's likely that much of Clarence's older audience isn't even aware of its existence. I doubt it would grasp the exact same crowd, but there's a lot of good to uncover if you're willing to be patient for it, and I did want to give it a fair shake here. Being crafted hot off the heels of its conclusion by many of the same people, not only is the Fungies coincidental to the latter's history, but instrumental in understanding the totality of it. Even if you find it and end up not liking it, I do think it's important to see how it's coming to understand Clarence. So allow us to throw you a bit of a soft pitch. 
the easiest parallel I can make may make this a little more palatable. Fungies is to Clarence what Summer Camp Island is to Adventure Time. Structurally and philosophically, the later series share a lot in common with their predecessors. They also hold a fair amount of crew members between them, often people who were there to mold those earlier shows in their formative years. Aesthetically, each of them are deceptively soft and sweet. It's not uncommon that people would label them as kid stuff. But as with most things, nothing is purely black and white. I think with Clarence too, they always, they love the sweet, charming, sincere, emotional side of the show. And all the like edgy, weird, gross out stuff they weren't so into. But we like both. And we wanted to do both, and it always was kind of that. It was a weird show, and it was a sweet show and a sincere show, and that's what I loved about it. And so, like, I think that was part of it too, where they're like, "Ah, oh, can we just do this part?" And we're like, "No, oh, we want to do this part too." So, like I said, there's a great tonal shift in this final season to the point where it makes individual episodes more difficult to highlight. It's an episodic comedy that felt way more still and reflective by this point. 90 plus episodes in the hole, and it's just starting to get deep and shit. The season premiere introduces the catalyst for the season-long arc. Sumo and a couple other kids are transferring out to West Aberdale Elementary due to possible gerrymandering, I guess? The new environment gave them the space and the resources to thrive in the way the previous one didn't, but this obviously affects the front back home. Everyone still hangs out outside of school, but things clearly aren't the same. Sumo was subject to the deepest development out of most, if not all, of the recurring characters. He really was forced to grow up, and in some episodes, you can't help but feel like he's done a complete 180. This is the driving force for the quieter conflicts at play. For once, it's starting to feel like Clarence may be forced to grow up too. Actually, there's an episode for that too, but it's a bit underwhelming. Typical building blocks are there. I doubt it would bore you, but the ending is a little rushed and, forgive me for saying this, maybe a touch too predictable. Sacrilege, I know. Honestly, I think the episodes that were closer in form to previous seasons address this a little bit better. Even when such a subject was not explicitly focused on, those episodes force you to sit with the uncomfortable ambient noise in the back of your head that you subconsciously use to keep track of how long your childhood's been dead and buried. The fun ones are fewer and farther in between, mind you, not in the absence of genuine entertainment or introspection or emotionality. I mean, they're thinkers that have funny moments, not the other way around. The sumo arc is explored all throughout, but there's a clear chain of episodes focused on him and the impact of his transfer that you could watch to get the gist of where this all went. I would also say that the adults of Aberdale Prime got fleshed out to completion here. Miss Baker always got a fair amount of focus for being a burnt-out victim of the public school system, and Reese, while still a perpetual sad sack of bones, got a few highlights over time. Shope has arguably been better comic relief than even the latter. I mean, she's rough around the edges to put it lightly, but damn, she could dunk! The episode they gave her here went really hard. I mean, I, I was not expecting this at all. If there's one episode that can maintain a balance between old and new Clarence best, it doesn't exist. But there is a series of six episodes that can easily substitute. Clarence's Stormy Sleepover is the first and only miniseries associated with the Clarence universe. Arguably an underrated chunk of the series, it draws parallels to Animation Domination's Night of the Hurricane. A three-part crossover taking place in the heart of a tropical storm featuring some Fox animated titans and Cleveland show. While there are no crossover elements or major easter eggs featured in Stormy Sleepover, the interconnected nature of the special reminds us just how small this universe really is. After years of wanting to produce long-form Clarence, this was as good as it got, which is pretty dang good. For an in-depth look, you should probably just watch Dan's review of it. It would be way more in-depth than I would choose to cover here. Outside of relevance to the season-wide arc, I'm only mentioning it so I can reference this milk scene.
Pretty good, huh? My man was gagged the entire time. He bodied that shit. Give him his Emmy. Give, give him his Emmy right now. What were you waiting for? Anyway, most episodes within Season 3 seamlessly blend together, but the one that's arguably most significant to the wider arc is the only crossover to its name. Hello. Uh, how do you do? Hi. Welcome. Very good, sir. Sure. Well, well, very well. <laughs> I love it. Welcome to my rental world. The time they reveal that home movies is canonically linked to Clarence is actually one of the most important points of the show as a concept. Which is so funny to me, because technically speaking, this wasn't supposed to fucking exist. And that one was too, I, I always felt bad about that because we never asked him, like, I didn't know they were going to design his character to look so much like the Brendan from right. the movies. Yeah. And then they did that and I was like, ooh, can we do that? And then I was like, I, I kind of regret, like, I wish I asked Brendan Small and, like, got his blessing because I, I have no idea how he feels about that or if he even knows about it, but hopefully he wasn't like, ooh, why'd they do that <laughs> without asking me? This was just a straightforward attempt to do an improv episode with someone who's actually kind of good at it, but it turned into all of this. It's almost an inverse of what happened with the Uncle Grandpa joint, except it makes even less sense than it would have before. The Clarence Kingdom Hearts pipeline is imminent. Just you fucking wait. Anyway, these two shows are now soul bonded, or like brothers only closer, sorry not sorry, I don't make the rules. But for the uninitiated, Home Movies is a show centered around this character as a kid who made amateur films with his friends. Unlike Clarence, which is well known for being centered around a child's authentic experience, Home Movies actually channels adult conflict through childlike or child-ish figures. Brendan in particular is more nuanced and multifaceted in this regard. More commonly, his impulsive, unfocused, mealy-mouthed, slightly egotistical traits are exploited and they make for great bases of stories. But his penchant for being thoughtful, intuitive, intellectually astute, and relatively inventive is what completes them. He is very much a work in progress the whole way through, but later on, when the use of long-running arcs and recurring bits increases, he also reflects more earnestly as a kid navigating a very lukewarm, detached existence. The final episode of the series, Focus Grill, brings his story to its apex after an existential crisis is spurred on when a few of his peers give feedback on his latest work. The final two minutes leaves things rather open-ended, but in most interpretations, Brendan's focus is redirected to his friends rather than his movies, the thing that's been holding him together since the beginning. Clarence's finale, Any Word But Sumo, is not intent on hammering home how important the power of friendship is since they've given us dozens of examples up to this point. Instead, they just chose to go straight for the jugular. Wait a minute, what day is it? March, April? <gasps> Hello, are you here for the sleepover? Cut my hair. Friendship, haircut, anniversary. Oh. Oh. <gasps> there have been points when our main trio have fought or gone through some misunderstandings or worked through long-standing differences, but this is perhaps the only time the dynamic has been so clearly challenged. The Holy Trinity is set to collapse in on itself in the quietest, most despondent way possible, and it's gut-wrenching. It's also thoroughly disgusting how relatable this is, bruh. Like, like half of us have been in this exact spot at some point, and nobody in the corporeal room has been privileged enough to hit that 104 million day summer break lotto. At least no one that we know of. Accounting for breaks and everything, the American school cycle is probably only like eight months long, maybe even less if you went to Catholic school or some shit, but the whole scope of this bond that was built to last, it was first formed over summer vacation. Despite the fact that Sumo was surreptitiously lumped into this district and more likely lives farther away from his classmates, that doesn't guarantee that they wouldn't end up hanging out anyway. Clarence isn't even thinking that far ahead. The amount of time between when the West Aberdeel transfer happened and now was already enough to make him feel really left out. And he tries so hard to fit back in too. This is his greatest strength. This is what he's known for. And there's nothing that he really does wrong here. It's just a matter of time slipping away. Until after all this scrambling for something, anything to shift the tide, a good change of pace finally lands in his lap. 
Summer break starts tomorrow. Give another pizza, please. Have a good summer. Next. Now, it's not a real resolution. Really, it feels more like a consolation for the last 10 minutes of torture. A singular moment of solace found in being together again. Finally. After so long. Jeff is like the biggest third wheel here, but him being himself was comparatively a breath of fresh air. He actually managed to be a, a grounding force for once. The three of them assemble on the couch to embrace the first lapse of summer vacation when this shit happens. What? what? Oh, dang. Yeah! 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 Oh! This is a clear and obvious triumph for our boys. Their circumstances will likely not stay the same forever, or even much longer after this point. Childhood's just kinda like that. You cannot control the flow of your means, but even amidst the chaos, palpable instability, or even plain boredom, you can still live every day like it's your last. Hey guys. Hey, see that little guy down there? That's Clarence. Clarence. Clarence? Clarence. Clarence is kind of the best ever. He has a treehouse made out of a laundry basket. Don't act like you're not jealous. Make Clarence your new best friend. Thank you. Part of the reason why this took so long to make is that the historical background in this video would change month by month. Every time I, I thought I had an angle, uh, some about the history of this thing would change and I would have to pivot. The angle was so simple before all this. It was just like, yeah, I mean, Cards Network, they were doing so well that their audience just started being a bunch of haters. And now, it, the, the angle is much closer to half of animation is on fucking fire every day I draw breath on this earth. You know, a lot of the problems are still the same, but they felt a lot simpler before. Creative freedom, financial immunity, visual synthesis, just a fickle viewer base? I mean, that's possible. From the jump, my only real job here has been to show you how and why this show is so good. Many of you are already convinced. Allegedly, many of you were enlightened the entire time. But you just wanted the hard evidence. You wanted to take a trip back down memory lane. You already know that while being relatively unpopular during its heyday, this show got to peacefully grow and exist alongside the rest of its colleagues. That seems to be applying to a slimmer slate of shows each month. It creates this really weird state of ennui when Uncle Grandpa gets wiped off the face of the earth while Cle this this isn't even fucking true anymore. You see how old, you see how old this shit is? This show was literally the net result of the medium becoming more diverse in thought and in kind, yet it was chastised by virtue of what kind of show it seemed to be. What was thought to be one of the most nauseating or emotionally stagnant shows of the Renaissance stands and shines bright next to any of its modern contemporaries. It's way easier to try and dredge up a 10 or 20 year old cartoon to talk about than to even attempt navigating the current minefield of cancelled, scrapped, neglected, or struck projects. Animation is a specific part of our modern culture, but that's because it pays to make it that way. It's supposed to be an art form first, but there's never gonna be a streamer or producer out there that'll let you forget its primary function. To me, Clarence represents the totality of what this shit means. It represents the full spectrum, the whole money of, of audiences of people. It represents change and growth in chaotic but ultimately normal and, and healthy ways. This is the peak of creative osmosis here. And that's that's what Cartoon Network's supposed to exemplify. That's what this art form is supposed to exemplify. It's these experimental bits and bobs that have informed several generations of people by this point. It is the most basic manifestation of this channel's nation ethos. Something as simple as digging through old convention panels highlight how much the creatives cared and what prospects are being left behind in the name of short-term savings. We don't share the same memories as those people talking about their craft, but universally we do understand how these things made us feel. And within the remnants of a studio that's literally being raised to the ground and moved to greener pastures, the lingering impact of this work is what's going to stick with us. That's what's going to keep the spirit of this shit alive. 
This series functions as a, a, a time capsule. Being able to stick by it now means so many things. A vote of confidence in Clarence is a vote of confidence for creativity, imagination, and freedom. It's a vote for unity, for adventurous storytelling, and unabashed raunch. It's a vote for compassion and bravery, for peace and love on a planet Earth that seemingly has less and less to offer each passing day. It's a vote for transparency, a plea to show the world as it truly is, as simple or complex as that may be. What is a mob to a king? What is a king to a god? What is a god to a non-believer? It's all relative. There are always going to be circumstances that are far beyond our control. There's always going to be an abundance of resources that we don't have access to or people that are just not going to be there for us. That's kind of normal. But if you find yourself as that one person that can take a, a small pocket of time and be able to make the most of that, and you single-handedly become the king of the world. That's all there is to it.